Hi folks, and welcome to another awesome online event from Climate Solutions. I'm Stephanie Noren, your favorite online MC. Um, and I'm just super excited for today. Today's part one of our Hope, Health and Climate series. We have another event, a uh, lunchtime event at noon, but congratulations to all of you who made it to a Thursday 4 p.m. Zoom webinar. Way to go. That is an awesome feat. I think we should definitely congratulate us all. Um, while folks are still signing in, we have a quick poll to see how folks are doing today. And so that you'll see that pop up on your screen and you can fill it out now. All right, and as folks are filling out that poll, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, for, before we do anything in our event, we'd like to acknowledge that we're all on Indigenous land. And if you don't know where you are, uh, you can look that up now. We have a resource you can look up wherever you are in the United States or in North America, and that will tell you about the original inhabitants of the land you're on. And ultimately, I think um, I was just thinking about what I was going to say for this part, because I think we had it scripted and I, you know, we want to encourage you to action and we have a uh, we have a web page with resources and um, we I would encourage you to go to that now. I think it's on screen. But I just wanted to note that as as non native people as people who are not native to North America um, and as beneficiaries of settler colonialism, it's it's really our responsibility to learn more about what that means and learn more about issues that are important uh, to indigenous folks in your area, whether that's inviting people to your um, advocacy tables, sharing seats of power, um, learning more about issues that are important to regional tribes. But um, we just really encourage you to do more than just know whose land you're on. And so uh, we have a web page on our website for those resources now. All right. And just a quick note that we'll be live tweeting today at Climate Solution with the hashtag Climate Hope. And just in a few quick minutes, I will be joined by our executive director, Greg Small, who will be having uh, a conversation with Dr. Leah Stokes. We're super excited about that. And then uh, Dr. Stokes will be joined by Dr. Howard Frumkin and Dr. Vinay Gupta and my colleague V from um, our Oregon office for another uh, facilitated conversation before we wrap up. five. So I um, encourage you to stay with us the whole time. And I think that uh, I'll be joined by Greg here any second. Hi, Greg. Hey, how are you doing, Stephanie? I'm pretty good. I'm feeling a little hot. I have some big <laughs> lights in front of me. So I'm kind of um, feeling that too, actually. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's it's pretty four o'clock is a tough time for a Zoom for a, a Zoom online event. So um, but I see Dr. Stokes is also joining us. So awesome. hi everyone. Hi. Great to be here. Great. All right, Leah, good to see you. I'm really excited about this conversation. Welcome. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to introduce you. And I was sort of scouring the web and trying to decide what to do to introduce you for your bio, because there's so much. <laughs> and I decided to take the a piece from Time Magazine. For folks who don't know, Leah got named as one of Time Magazine's 2022 Time 100 Next. First of all, congratulations. That's a very oh, cool award. You. And in it, um, Minnesota Senator Tina Smith, who's an incredible climate champion, wrote the piece about you. And I just want to read a quick thing to just give a little context for you. Um, quote, in August, President Joe Biden signed historic legislation to address the climate emergency, taking action to significantly lower emissions by 2030. Leah Stokes, a political science professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, was a powerhouse contributor to this effort. Leah is a thoughtful leader, researcher, expert communicator, and organizer all into one dynamic and very fun person. So anyways, that's a pretty cool intro. Um, so again, welcome, Leah. Really good to see you. And thanks for taking your time. 
Oh, it's so great to be here. And yeah, that was a big honor. And I'm a big fan of Senator Smith. You know, she worked very hard as well to get that uh, climate bill over the finish line. And so, you know, so many people named and unnamed, you know, are really deserve a lot of credit for the moment that we find ourselves in now. For sure. Well, I wanted to start actually on that topic of the federal climate bill, which is passed now, I don't know, three months or so ago. And um, you know, obviously, I think almost everybody on this call has heard a little bit about it, but I wonder from your perspective, who was engaged in it at a very deep level, both as an organizer, as a thought leader, you know, from your perspective, why was it such a big deal that this bill passed? Why is, why is this such a momentous occasion? Well, you know, we've been trying to pass federal climate legislation for around three decades now. And, <laughs> right. you know, we have uh, Bill McKibben out there who wrote sort of one of the first books, if not the first popular book on climate change in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And he's been sort of waiting and watching for decades to see if something yeah. would ever happen. And we've had many near misses, right? Of course, the Waxman-Markey bill yeah. um, back in 2009, right? That was a really unfortunate thing that happened. And so many of us uh, felt that we couldn't fail again, that there wasn't time left on the clock. When we talk about the need to cut carbon pollution in half this decade, you know, that's the 50% below 2005 levels. That's a number you hear a lot, and it's something that President Biden has committed to. We're not going to get there if we don't have federal action. And so what this bill di did is it is going to help put us on a path to cut carbon pollution by 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. So that gets us, you know, four fifths of the way, 80% of the way to the goal. Um, and, you know, just in a concrete way for all of us, there's lots of incentives now that are available for everyday Americans to get right. an electric vehicle, to get a heat pump, to get solar on your roof. And if you don't know, you know, what kind of money's out there, whether for you, in your own journey towards electrification and clean energy or your neighbors or your family members or your friends, uh, I really would recommend this resource at rewiringamerica.org. You just go there and they have a calculator where you can put in your zip code, put in some basic information and you can figure out, you know, how much money can I get to get a heat pump, for example. So this this bill is going to be transformative to all kinds of Americans in terms of helping us all get access to clean energy technologies to say nothing about, you know, all the new jobs it's going to create and so on and so forth. Are there any, I mean, there's so many things in this bill, as you well know, are there any sort of pieces of the bill that you feel like or hidden gems or things that you think maybe don't get as much attention, but you think actually are pretty meaningful that people might not know about? Absolutely. So first, there are those consumer facing incentives that right. I just mentioned, you know, maybe those of us who are hanging out on a Thursday afternoon on a Zoom webinar with a bunch of doctors who care about climate, maybe we know a little bit about what's in the bill. But you know, probably a lot of your friends don't and maybe you don't even fully know, like, did you know, you can get $2,000 off a heat pump? heat pump hot water heater? Did you know you can get 30% off solar? Did you know you can get thousands of dollars off an electric vehicle? There's a lot of these things that people don't know. And even if you do know, it's going to be important to help help other people figure this out. Because as we say at Rewiring America, it's kind of like there's a bank account or a wallet sitting around for every single American household that will help them get access to clean technologies. And most people don't know that they could, it's kind of like walking down the street and finding a $20 bill on the road, right? You'd be so excited. Well, how about finding $2,000 on the road for a heat pump, right? That's what we're talking about here. So, you know, helping connect people to these resources is really important. And then on more of like the policy wonky side, less consumer facing, less everyday Americans uh, oriented, you know, there's probably around uh, $15 billion in this bill to help retire coal and replace it with clean power. So people may know that there's a lot of utilities in this country that run coal plants. These coal plants are not economic. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you built a wind turbine next to a coal plant tomorrow, and you turned off the coal plant and you left the wind plant running, you would actually save people money on their electricity bills. Energy innovation has been showing this for years. And so yeah. keeping these coal plants open is not just bad for the climate. It's not just bad for local air pollution. It's not just bad um, for, you know, mining. It's also really bad for people's wallets, for their energy bills. And so there's a lot of money in this bill to make that transition happen, to help shut down coal plants. And then 
folks might not realize, but this is really industrial policy. Right. What do I mean when I say that? I mean that it's going to create a lot of jobs in the United States to manufacture everything from solar panels to heat pumps to batteries, electric vehicles. And it's amazing. Since President Biden took office, there have been $85 billion in private capital deployed for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure here in the United States. Like, wow, that's just amazing. So when we say the bill is $370 billion, it's not true because the bill is catalyzing additional spending through companies basically investing in creating jobs in the United States. And remember that number is just a guess. It's what some people in the government guess we might spend. And it's up to all of us now to spend even more money because that's yeah. what the bill allows. We can go a lot farther and faster. If we, for example, tell our friends about the heat pump or the electric vehicle or the solar panels that they can get. Awesome. Well, I'd love to go a few more hours on this, but I want to step back. And if people do want to go a couple hours, they should listen to either David Roberts or Ezra Klein talking to Jesse Jenkins because they they go through it all. But I kind of want to step back from the um, from the climate bill and talk about sort of the overall picture of climate in the United States. And I did some writing a little bit ago where I sort of laid out this my belief that we now have four pillars in place to really, for the first time ever. Have a foundation for success. They are massive federal investments like this and the CHIPS Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill, a huge amount of state and local policy, which I think hopefully will even pick up more because we've got four states, that, four more states with trifectas, mm -hmm. and then corporate commitments. So you've got, to me, you've got these four gigantic pillars where there's a lot of momentum. And I'm not saying the work is done, but I feel like we've got a foundation. And I wonder. If you see it that way, that you think those are the right pillars and what else is missing to get to speed and scale here in the United States? Yeah, I think that's a really smart way to think about it. You know, there are all of these policy levers that we can be pulling as activists, as employees, you know, in all the different as as citizens in all the different ways that we just live, even as consumers. And, you know, some of those pillars involve trying to get our city to do something differently. For example, passing a ban on gas and new construction, which yeah. I think Los Angeles just did, maybe even today. Or last week, Los Angeles passed a ban on oil drilling, effective immediately. You can't do any new oil drilling in the city, which if you've ever been to LA, you know, well, there's like oil drilling all over the city. Yeah. Um, so getting your city to do something getting your state to do something, you know, working together with other activists, working through organizations to put pressure on state houses. We now have, for example, Minnesota and right. Michigan with Democratic trifectas, with leaders who are really poised and excited to get climate bills passed next year. So supporting those efforts is going to be huge. And that builds on, for example, the $54 billion that was passed in California this year, as well as changes in setback rules for oil extraction. Like there's a lot of great wins. Um, out of Maryland, there was a big climate bill. Connecticut passed a big climate yep. bill. Um, Massachusetts recently had a big climate bill. So we have a bunch of states acting and that's great. The federal government is now going to create a basically cash infusion into right. all that state and local effort, as well as into private actors, you know, companies who want to set up manufacturing for heat pumps in the United States. We don't make heat pumps in the United States right now, but hopefully by next year we will, right? Yep. Because for example, the president invoked the Defense Production Act to try to increase our supply of heat pumps. And so that's what's happening across the board for all kinds of technologies. So we really are starting to see momentum and wind in our sails. And it's a great time to get more involved in climate because you can have wins and winning is fun. You know what I mean? For those for those like Bill McKibben who've been in the trenches for I decades, know. he's had a lot of losing. But if you join in now and get involved now, you get to join when we have momentum. And that's a good fun time. That's true. I know. I mean, in the Northwest, we've been winning a lot. I mean, we passed a lot of state policies. Um... Yes. A lot of local stuff. City of Seattle just did an executive order on transportation yesterday. The city of yes. Portland just became the first city in the country to to start to phase out the use of diesel. I mean, next and the week, building codes building that codes. Inslee put forward, right? Like, there's awesome stuff. The transportation. I think there was 17 billion dollars that Inslee uh, invested in transportation, right? For like electrifying ferries, for example. Very exciting. Uh, yeah, great stuff happening in the Northwest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as, as people who know me and have heard me say often, we are, we're now in a new era on climate action, and we've been in new eras before, and most of the times we've entered new eras, it's been because we've failed. 
obviously the Waxman Markey situation. And I remember after that bill passed, it was hard to go talk in legislator legislatures about climate. They would like laugh us out of the building. So it was a new era then, but it was really grounded on failure. And now we're moving in this new era because we've got a lot of success. We're not done in any way, but there's a different set of challenges. And I guess that's where I wanted to close at least my chat with you on is, you know, in your in Senator Smith's um, description of you, she referred to you as many things, including an organizer. And you're an incredible thought leader. You're an academic. You're also an organizer. And you've spent a lot of time in the climate movement. And you know folks in the climate movement. And I wonder if you can just reflect on, you know, what are we doing well right now as a climate movement? And partially in response to what I was saying about this new era, what do we need to do differently and better as a climate movement to sort of leverage all this opportunity we have? Great question. Well, I think the first thing is that we need to keep broadening the movement. We need to keep calling more people in. You know, climate change and our movement cannot be defined by our opponents, namely fossil fuel companies. They've spent decades saying that it wasn't possible to do anything about this, that if we did, it would be terrible. You'd have to sit alone in the dark in your house with a sweater and like cry, I don't know, eat cold cereal or something. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't be able to eat meat. And it's great if people don't eat meat. That's a great choice. But you know, we have to broaden the movement. We've got to bring people in. And we need to do that by telling hopeful stories that are about abundance and the world that we want, right? right. Yep. If you want to have a car because you live in a place that has urban sprawl that's not going to be changed overnight, you can have a car. That's cool. Guess what? It can be an electric vehicle rather than a car that runs on oil. If yep. you'd like to heat and cool your home, me too. In fact, more people need to heat and cool their home because we've warmed the planet. And we've seen, for example, insane heat waves in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. unprecedented. And you can do that with a heat pump. And in the side effect is that you're not poisoning yourself and your children and your pets and anybody who comes in your house by using fossil fuels in your home. And all this new research is showing how dirty and dangerous it is to be using fossil fuels in our home. So we want to tell the story of abundance here. Cheaper energy bills, you know, cleaner air, you know, happier life. Like biking, for example, I'm sure there's people who bike. Like biking is a really fun thing to do, actually. And we want to paint a picture for the world that is actually the, a fun and positive one. And that means that the movement needs to be inclusive. It needs to call people in. It needs to have more diversity. And I think in particular, you know, we need people to career switch and yeah. to do activism switch into the climate movement, you know, so that's what I think we need to do. And part of envisioning the world that's possible is saying that the movement needs to be organized more around saying yes. So as you were saying, Greg, we've gone through Thank these you. moments. Thank you. <laughs> we've gone through these moments where we had to be saying no. Absolutely. You know, the heroic work of organizers at 350, for example, to stop the Keystone Pipeline. Super important work, right? And that was work that broadened the movement, that brought people in, the divestment movement, for example, right? We need to say no. And there's a lot of importance to saying no to dirty things. Sure. But we're also in a moment where we have to build at a pace and scale that's unprecedented. And it means that all of us need to be like what we say, yimbies, yes, in my backyard, right? We need to say yes to things like putting solar panels on our roofs, to putting heat pumps in our homes. You know, we need to say yes to doing more things faster. And I will say, I know I'm like giving a list, is like an infomercial for Bill McKibben, but he is a wonderful leader in the movement. Yes. And he started an organization called Third Act recently, yeah. which is about people 60 and older organizing. And a lot of what they're trying to do is show up to say yes to things, to actually be building the positive um, things that we need in our communities. So, you know, I feel like this is a really great moment to broaden the movement, to say yes. You know, we still have to stop bad fossil fuels, do not get me wrong, but a lot of it needs to be about painting this abundant picture of the future and where we all want to go together. I agree with that 100%. When I think about the core of what Climate Solutions is an organization, it is about one word, which is yes. <laughs> That's what we need to say more. Of. I have to go, uh, unfortunately, and hand it off to others. But thank you for this conversation. For folks, you're going to hear more from Leah, uh, and I look forward to hearing it. But it's now my honor to hand the uh, uh, baton off to my great colleague, who I see now on the screen, V. Picar. V. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thanks so much. Hey, Greg. Hey, Dr. Stokes. I'm so excited to continue the conversation and bring you to the official panel portion of our event.
And as Greg shared, my name is V. Paycar, and I'm the Oregon Transportation Policy Manager based out of rainy Portland, Oregon today. And I'm so happy to be able to be here tonight to help moderate this conversation with these three brilliant and inspiring leaders, all working in the intersections of climate change solutions, public health, and giving us the courage to continue this much needed work. And at this time, I'd like to bring on the virtual stage, Dr. Howard Frumpkin and Dr. Vin Gupta, who will be joining us to complete this great panel. And good evening, Dr. Frumpkin and Dr. Gupta. On behalf of Climate Solutions and everyone here, I wanted to thank you both and Dr. Stokes again for being with us here tonight. Um, really nice to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to share a quick bio for everyone in the audience, um, just so everyone knows who you are. And then in the spirit of kind of the virtual Zoom that everyone's got accustomed to, we're going to be doing an icebreaker. Um, and so Dr. Frumpkin, I'll start with you. Um, Dr. Frumpkin is a physician and epidemiologist and is a senior vice president with the Trust for Public Land and Professor Emeritus of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington School of Public health. Welcome. And Dr. Gupta is an active critical care pulmonologist and major in the U.S. Air Force Medical Corps Reserve. He serves and is, as an affiliate assistant professor of health metrics sciences at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington and is the chief medical officer for Amazon. And so again, wanted to share deep appreciation for all three of you being here. And so our icebreaker today is what brings you the most joy in the climate movement. Um, so Dr. Frumpkin, why don't we start with you? Young activists. I love watching them work and they're changing everything. In fact, if I were gonna add a pillar to Greg's list of pillars, that would be my pillar. I 100% agree with that. Uh, Dr. Gupta, how about you? Uh, I, I would say better health for all. Definitely. And Dr. Stokes? Uh, I think those were great answers, first of all. Um, but for me, I think it's the friendships. You know, uh, a lot of this can feel like hard, difficult work, but actually you're doing it in these really deep ways with people that you meet along the journey. And that that becomes very meaningful. Definitely being in community and being able to share and bask in this in this hope and change that we want to see in the world, I think creates really good connections. So it's always nice to, to have that in a movement. Um, and it's something the climate movement definitely brings. Um, so now that we've grounded kind of in this joy, um, I wanted to start the conversation um, with our major theme of our event tonight, which is hope. Um, so for the first question, I'd like to start by sharing this quote uh, from one of Dr. Frumpkin's articles, uh, Hope, Health, and the Climate Crisis. So this quote is, optimism is an individual's confidence in a good outcome, whereas hope is a goal-oriented way of thinking that makes an individual invest time and energy in planning how to achieve their aims. And this topic of hope comes up all the time in our work because many folks express that the climate crisis is daunting because we just really have so far to go in such a short amount of time to avoid the worst impacts. And many of those worst impacts are already being seen around the world and affecting the most vulnerable populations, even though they contributed the least to this problem. Um, so with Dr. Frumpkin's analysis that action is intrinsic to hope, I wanted to ask when we see climate policies that move us forward, like the IIJA, you know, we're thinking, yes, we want to celebrate. And uh, we know that we still have a lot to go to, to really um, achieve the, the, the kind of the magnitude of the, of the climate crisis, right? Um, so is that, is that hope at work? And, um, and how does hope factor in this kind of daunting magnitude of, of this climate crisis? Um, so I know it's a big question, but Dr. Frumpkin, let's start with you. Well, thanks very much, V. I, I'm a big believer in hope, and I, I kind of got into thinking about it as a physician and uh, climate activist because I was realizing more and more that despair is very common. Young people are very vocal about that. And, and you know, there's plenty of basis to feel despair. There are Doomer uh, articles coming out, Doomer books and so on. But I here's why I believe in hope. Number one, hope is good for you. We have a big body of medical evidence showing that hopeful people are healthier and hopelessness is toxic. 
So if your calling happens to be health and well-being, which is true for me, then you want to propel hope just for that reason. But that's not all. Secondly, action is intrinsic to hope. Hopeful people get things done and hopeless people don't. This is a time when we need to get a lot done. So for practical reasons, we need to propel hope. And the last part is that there is an empirical basis for hope. It, it's clear that we have not lost this war. I don't want to sugarcoat it. We're, we're facing daunting challenges, but there is plenty of basis for believing that we can turn things around and avoid the worst of the outcomes that we fear. Leah just mentioned a whole bunch of victories in the past few years, and they really deserve celebrating. The automobile uh, market is turning faster than we thought it would. Uh, renewable electricity is coming online faster and cheaper than we thought it could. Public opinion is shifting faster than we thought it could. There is a lot of basis for hope. So this is not a, a, an empty rhetorical claim. This is a, an evidence-based set of attitudes that we can embrace. I'm all for hope. Definitely. And I love your three-prong solution um, for hope that always helps to encapsulate and make me remember so I never lose that hope and keep on going. Um, Dr. Stokes or Dr. Gupta, do you want to go next? Well, all I have to say is that was awesome, Dr. Frumkin. You really brought it, man. I mean, I love the empirical evidence here that being hopeful is actually better. You're going to get stuff done. You're going to live longer, be happier. Sounds good. Uh, for a lot for a lot of my thinking around hope, uh, it really draws on Rebecca Solnit, who I know is also speaking as part of this series. She wrote an amazing book called Hope in the Dark, which I couldn't recommend more highly. Like you could just basically highlight the entire book. And, you know, she <laughs> talks a lot about how partial victories, especially amongst the left, um, can be turned, you know, can can be lamented or, you know, complained about, and that that doesn't provide momentum to people or a feeling of purpose or joy or achievement. And so, yes, we never get exactly what we wanted, um, but the world doesn't seem to work that way. It works in more circuitous fashion. And um, Hope is about showing up and putting in the time. And that's, it's a really active thing. Sometimes we, we like, like Dr. Frumkin was talking about too, around optimism versus hope, right? It's not about sitting around and just, oh, I hope it'll go okay. It's really an action. It's a verb. And so, yeah, I, I would really recommend folks listen to the talk that Rebecca Solnit's going to give as well as read her work because she is the queen of um, talking about hope and, and how it's related to activism. Thank you. Yeah, and Dr. Gupta, any other uh, thoughts you wanna share? Yeah, v, no, just to, just to build on what Dr. Frumpkin has already said, and then Leah, your your great opening remarks. I, I'm hopeful that that we have a pathway to communicate and persuade more people that may, might have been skeptical about climate change or non-believers that this is something to take seriously, both when they're going to the ballot box and sort of day to day. And, and, and part of that is just evidence generation. We are telling a more compelling story about uh, the health impacts. I say this as a pulmonologist, the health impacts of climate over the last 10 to 15 years, how they're worsening, whether it's warmer temperatures leading to 300,000 plus deaths annually, air pollution now, we didn't realize this even five years ago, air pollution is the fifth leading cause of death in isolation worldwide. It accounts for 7% of all deaths worldwide, about 5 million. That is, uh, that is an incredible amount of just loss due to a climate risk factor in isolation. And we didn't have those data points, again, just even toward the end of the 2010s. Now we can tell a more clear, concise story at the population level, at the individual level. And this is where I think I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to persuade more and more people over time. At the individual level, it's becoming clearer again because we have better evidence generation, a better, more convincing story to persuade that moms, expectant moms, when they're thinking about the health of their baby, we know that in utero exposure to say wildfire smoke can impact their son or daughter's growing immune system for a decade plus after birth, in addition to some perinatal complications. We of course know it can worsen the, uh, the chronic trajectory of COPD or asthma or heart failure. What's clear now, though, is that these climate risk factors are not just causing acute, episodic exacerbations of one's health. 
they can impact one's health for a very long period of time. And again, this is because we can tell a better, more persuasive story, and it makes our messaging that much more convincing. And just even a few years ago, we didn't have these data points as nicely as we do now. So that's why I'm hopeful. Thanks, Dr. Gupta. Yeah, those are really powerful messages. And I think, you know, one of the questions that we got a lot from, from folks is about like that behavior change and, you know, how to talk to people about this, um, you know, the climate movement, climate change um, issues. Uh, and so the question is generally around like, how do we um, make climate change issues more tangible? And, and as you shared, um, you know, a lot of the public health effects of climate change are really great ways to get people to get people understanding like this is this is affecting me this is affecting my family uh, today um and so even if it's something that you know climate change you know in in 10 20 50 years will do this to our planet um there is that kind of immediacy and and that that um uh, that importance that if we make those changes now, we can start to see um, improvements in our public health. Um, so um, one of the questions was kind of, what are your best practices for behavior change? And if generally like tying climate change to public health or even, you know, the wins in climate change mean that we can, um, you know, have cleaner air to breathe, uh, cleaner water, um, more thriving communities, more jobs, uh, all these things. Um, I was wondering if um, Dr. Gupta, if you want to start first um, uh, to add on to what you've already uh, talked about, um, how what are those like best practices for behavior change? Sure, sure. Uh, you, you know, I come from a background clinically where I've had to do everything from trying to help people stop smoking to take the COVID vaccine. So uh, it, difficult messaging in the healthcare space. Um, I didn't plan on this, but this has been, I guess, part of my life's work now. And, and I think climate change, and particularly the health consequences of climate change, fall in that terrain of, it's a, a potentially a difficult conversation to have, but my gosh, the rewards are fantastic if you can land the message. And part of it is, I think often we talk about climate change and abstractions, clean energy, great new jobs, a green economy, all these attendant benefits. And yet, to your point, V, people don't understand how it actually impacts them and their families, their children. So making that as specific as possible, audience segmentation, who's right across from you? You know, Dr. Frumpkin and I at the bedside uh, in, in the clinic, for example, thinking about who that individual is, that patient is right across from us, talking to them in their terms about stuff that matters to them. So if it's a, an expectant mom, uh, I, we just spoke about the ways in which climate change very tangibly can impact their health or the health of their uh, of their uh, young baby. Um, I, I think it's critical when we talk about things that have impact all of us, like air pollution, driving it down very, very to the basic terms of why is it that air pollution actually causes heart dysfunction. That's one of the big things that air, pol air pollution drives heart disease. Air pollution can worsen lung disease, even if you otherwise are, have a healthy heart or if, let's say you didn't even have lung disease, it can cause lung disease. Why? How does that, how does that even make sense? Turns out all those tiny particles you can't see that you're breathing in are lodging in your deepest arteries and they're causing those lungs to, or that heart to experience inflammation and then ultimately dysfunction. We need to be able to talk about these uh, why these things are happening at the microscopic level in clear, accessible language, just like we talk about why you get vaccinated, to try to convince as many people as possible. I'll lastly just say, for so long in public health, and Dr. Frump can keep me honest here, but in so long in public health, and the way we communicate to, say, all Americans across the country, it's one risk factor, one disease. I smoke, I get emphysema. I eat terribly, I'm going to have high cholesterol, I might have a heart attack. Climate change has changed how we should be talking about public health. It is an exacerbator to other risk factors all around us. It causes synergistic risks of disease. There's air pollution all around us, and then there's your own behavior. So if you're a smoker and you're inhaling bad air, your risk of a bad outcome is 20-fold higher. If you're eating uh, poorly and you're breathing in bad air episodically, 
your risk of heart disease is many fold higher. We need to be thinking and communicating in that synergistic risk framework to more people. Yeah, and I'd love to just build on what Dr. Gupta was saying about making it specific. You know, when we talk about bad air, you know, bad air quality, what do we actually mean by that? Well, it turns out a lot of us are basically running fossil fuel plants from our homes. What? What do you mean? I have a power plant in my basement? Yes, you do. It's called a furnace. You've also got one in your kitchen. It's called a gas stove. Those things run on fossil fuels. They burn things. It's called gas, right? Fossil gas, natural gas, methane. It's a gas that comes into your house that you then combust. And when you burn something, just like if you were over a campfire or walking down a busy road, when we are burning things, it creates pollution. That pollution is things like nitrous oxides, particulate matter. Um, and actually what we're learning from recent science is that it's also carcinogens. So things that cause cancer, benzene, formaldehyde. And it turns out that these gas stoves, for example, or gas appliances, your gas uh, clothes dryer, your hot water tank, your furnace, they can be leaking gas, leaking bad air quality into your house, even when they are turned off. And if a child grows up in a home with a gas stove, they have a 42% increased risk of, of asthma. When I start telling people this, they are shocked because people don't realize like, oh my gosh, I'm burning something in my house and it's a fossil fuel and it has carcinogens in it. It's kind of like if you're a smoker and it's not even metaphorically like if you're a smoker, you can create levels of indoor air pollution that are akin to being in a, a house with a smoker people are going to start seeing things differently. You know, it's interesting because this isn't visible to us, right? If you take cigarette smoke, you can see it, but you can't see the combustion coming out of the tailpipe of your car or the gas leaking in your house, let alone, you know, the air pollution when you just use your gas stove. So talking about these issues, talking about the ways that fossil fuels in our own lives are actually harming our own health, it's a massive eye opener for people. Um, you know, people just don't understand that that that's what they're doing. And why don't they understand? Because the gas industry has lied to them and marketed to them for decades. They've been saying cooking with gas, right? As if it's a nice thing, as if it's a good thing. And right. it's not. And we've now got much better technologies with heat pumps, induction stoves, electric vehicles. You don't have to use these shady gas appliances anymore. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it's part of that of making how to make that climate pollution more visible to people, right, and more tangible. Um, and for folks in the audience, I know this is a really riveting conversation, but we're going to take a quick break. Um, we're going to go um, rip out your gas stove in the next 10 minutes. That's what exactly. the time is for. <laughs> And um, we're going to come back in about um, 10 minutes, um, but right now I'm going to be passing it to uh, my colleague and friend, Savita Redipathy, um, who's the Deputy Director of Climate Solutions, as well as Stephanie Noren, who you've heard of, who you've heard from earlier uh, today. And so um, we'll continue this conversation. I think it's over to you two for this next segment. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Wow, Steph, wasn't that just an amazing panel on hope, health, and climate? I'm feeling so much more hopeful and inspired to do a lot more work. You know, I was just reflecting how much I learned in like the last 10 minutes and also how much we kind of really take for granted. I think hearing Dr. talk about the statistics that we use every day, you know, I think we, we take, yeah, we use those every day. Um, to try to convince people of the need to act on climate and just thinking about a time that we didn't have that. So um, yeah, I just, I'm really grateful that we I got to hang out today. Yes, and I'm looking forward to bringing all the panelists back. And I'm not sure if you know, Steph, but Rebecca Solnit, tomorrow's event speaker is watching right now too. I did not know that, but that <laughs> is another reason to feel nervous and get a little sweaty. Um, so just to, I think I neglected to um, also announce that if you have not registered for tomorrow, it's a lunchtime event. So it's a noon, a 30 minute event. Uh, we're super excited to host Rebecca Solnit and you can register. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat right now. Great. Thanks so much, Steph. And hi, thanks everyone for being here today. I'm Savitha Redipathy, and I have worked on climate, the biggest justice issue of our lifetimes for 25 years. Almost 13 of those have been at Climate Solutions, where I've seen that we are undoubtedly helping lead the way on climate action. 
Climate Solutions is focused on mission critical work at the state and local levels because the progress that we make here has an impact that goes far beyond our region. As you just heard, we're seeing solutions everywhere from government to business to activists and the nonprofit community. Here in Washington and Oregon, the last few years have been a time of incredible progress. We passed groundbreaking policies that have firmly established this region as a national leader in climate policy. Oregon has the clean, uh, strongest clean fuel standard in the country. Washington now has the strongest building codes in the US for new residential and commercial construction. Our region is among a growing number of states legally committed to 100% clean electricity. And our state's leaders passed these policies, not only because they're good ideas, they also did this because people like you called for these changes. Thank you. Nationally, our federal government passed the most consequential climate policy in our history, the Inflation Reduction Act. We just heard from Greg and Dr. Leah Stokes, one of the foremost experts on this. And only yesterday, Portland, Oregon became the first city in the country to phase out petroleum diesel by 2030. Let's keep adding to this momentum of climate action and remember that things that seem impossible truly can happen. We can turn the promise of policies and investments into real progress on the ground, cutting more pollution, creating more good paying jobs and investing in solutions in the hardest hits and historically underinvested communities that bear the brunt of climate injustice. 2023 is Climate Solutions 25th anniversary. It will also be a critical and consequential year to address the climate crisis. There is momentum and hope for truly transformative climate solutions and at the scale that is needed. We know that historic pollution is in our atmosphere and that more impacts in the coming years, if not months, are all but inevitable. Many of us know someone who was at the 18 inning Mariners playoff game, go Ems, in the smoke and 80 degrees in October in Seattle. I do my best to not think about the personal and compounding health impacts of our wildfires. And though the science and trends are overwhelming, it's not too late. You heard from the panelists about what brings them each hope. You all bring me hope. Hope is action. Thank you for facing the climate crisis with us. While the scale of the crisis is huge and the timeline for action is short, many of the solutions and technology already exist and more investments are coming. A rapid transition is not only feasible, but also is well underway. Shifting away from fossil fuels and towards building new ways to power our economy with clean energy. As President Biden reminded the world last month at COP, good climate policy is good economic policy. What stands in our way is the status quo, and overcoming this is the decisive work of our decade. How? By working with Climate Solutions and our partners and the movement we continue to build together. And especially as we start our 25th anniversary next year and carry out our new strategic plan to do four big things. One, pass, implement, and share the success of groundbreaking policies. Two, strengthen collaborative partnerships, deepen storytelling, and align for greater power building. Three, identify and foster innovations across the public and private spectrum in our region. And four, invest in thriving organizational health. As Greg shared, we are in a new era. And the core challenge of this new era is to turn our policy wins into progress on the ground. It's not enough to only pass good laws, we must also make sure that our leaders and agencies implement new policies equitably and inclusively so that people in communities, especially people of color and those who have been first and worst impacted and least responsible for climate change, experience tangible, broadly shared benefits and our states achieve their desired goals. What will success look like as we accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy across all sectors? Good family wage jobs. Buildings where we live, work, play, and learn are powered by clean electricity instead of fossil gas. Everyone having access to affordable electric vehicles and electric mobility options, including public charging, especially in underinvested communities. More homegrown clean energy like wind and solar. Increased and affordable transit options for all, especially for those who rely on them the most research and development to accelerate newly emerging technologies, 
Stories that show that the transition to clean energy is coming soon to everyone's communities and that it's affordable and accessible for all. Real and noticeable health and economic benefits, especially for people of color and low income and rural communities. And clean energy vehicles replacing dirty diesel buses and trucks, especially in communities with the worst air quality. And for my nieces and the kids in your life, electric school buses. Your support will help Climate Solutions implement and protect the policies we've helped pass in Oregon and Washington, like clean fuel standards and 100% clean electricity. Continue to work with partners and connect with all of you to engage on climate action and a just transition. Collaborate and innovate on new ideas and programs and support and strengthen and grow our amazing team. We need to protect all that we have accomplished and we need to move further and faster on climate action. To paraphrase Lizzo, it's about time. And in the words of MLK Jr., it really is the fierce urgency of now. There is more work to do and we can only do it with all of you. Thank you for giving me hope. Thank you for being here today and for your support of Climate Solutions. We're excited to start our 25th anniversary with you all. Now here's a short video before I turn it back to Steph V and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Savvy. I, um, you know, when you're in the daily grind of things, you don't always think about the full body of our work together. And that was just a pretty remarkable uh, run through of all the things that we've accomplished in the last couple of years and all the things that we're hoping to do. So thank you. I would like to take a moment to thank a few people as well. So I would like to thank our climate leader sponsor, uh, Audi, and our climate protector sponsor, Lisa Adato, as well as our climate partners and hosts and friends and supporters uh, that you're seeing on the slides right now. And thank you to all of you who are attending tonight. Um, you know, without you, the event wouldn't be possible. We'd just be talking to ourselves and without our sponsors, it definitely helps make our series possible. And just a quick reminder that today is a part of our month long giving campaign, Hope, Health and Climate. And you can donate uh, to Climate Solutions by giving with the link on, uh, giving at the link on your screen. And I just wanna note that we're raising $100,000 which sounds big, $100,000, uh, but there's hundreds of you watching today. And so we would encourage all of you to uh, consider a donation with whatever you can give. 100% participation is an awesome thing. And um, yeah, I'll give you a moment to look at that right now. Climatesolutions.org forward slash give. And you know, your donation does a lot. You just heard uh, Savita give a really great overview of all the work that you've helped participate and lead at Climate Solutions that we've collaborated with partners and our elected officials on. And ultimately, I'm just remembering this uh, quote from an earlier Climate Leaders Live this year um, from our Solutions from the States, Kelly Nardini with Conservation Colorado. And she said, you know, passing the policy is sexy, but implementation doesn't seem as sexy, but it's just as important. And we have passed some incredible policies in Washington and Oregon, really at the forefront of leading the country um, in climate policy. And it's time to make those policies really work for our states and work for the people and work for everyone. And so, you know, this new phase of climate action in Washington is really about ensuring that these laws that we passed are equitable and just and that they work for everyone and continue to reduce emissions. And your donation will also help strengthen our relationship with partners and continue to collaborate with them, elected officials, and all of our supporters, uh, the people like you. There are so many ways that you can give the Climate Solutions and I will list a few of them right now. Um, you can give online, you can do a monthly gift. If you wanna make a big impact, you can donate via stock or a donor advised fund. Um, I personally really love a monthly giving option uh, for some, you know, some organizations I give like $10 a month. And it's a really great way for me personally to um, 
to give as much as I can, but to, you know, like limit that per month for my budget. It's also a great way to increase your giving if you give monthly, um, so you can spread that out throughout the year. And I just really want to uh, reiterate that every gift does matter. So we, we have you know, folks who donate quite a bit and we have folks that donate what they can. And those $25 gifts, those $50 gifts, they really do make a huge difference. So we would encourage all of you to consider a donation today as a part of our month long giving campaign. And the last thing I'll say about uh, the ask and you know the uh, the fundraising piece of this is that um, I work so I work in climate. I've worked for conversations for a number of years. I do this every day, and we talk about the clean energy future. We talk about the transition. We talk about getting off of fossil fuels, and I'm surrounded by you know great thinkers and all these great people. And sometimes I still really struggle in believing that it's possible to solve the climate crisis. Um, and I'm just admitting that I. I sometimes struggle to hold and maintain the belief that we can actually, you know, transition off of fossil fuels to power that power our lives. It seems so big. Um, but then I come to work every day and I meet or I'm, I work with just incredible people who show sheer um, grit and passion and dedication to this work. I see our elected officials taking risks and, and you know, going out there to vote for great climate policy. I see our partners who are making, you know, six Zoom calls a day to really make this happen. And I get really inspired by all of our supporters like you and just seeing that collective action and knowing that we are not alone in the belief in the kind of sheer uh, stubbornness uh, for a clean energy future is really what brings us um, to continue moving forward. And you heard Dr. Stokes say earlier today that hope is an action. It is not just a feeling that we have on the couch. It is something that we're doing every day to make our clean energy future possible. And I just want to say that, you know, every gift in that way is an action for hope. And so I hope you will consider that uh, at some point during our month long campaign or today. Lastly, it is an honor to share in our success in Washington and Oregon with so many of you who you have helped us get there. And it is an honor to stand before you and ask for your continued support, giving and action in this work. So thank you. All right, now back to the good stuff. I've got V back. I've got Dr. Stokes back, I've got Howie back, I've got Dr. Gupta back, and I'm gonna turn it over to them. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you, Savita, as well. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're gonna hop back into the second half of our panel discussion. Um, and so we had a really good conversation about kind of behavior change, um, how to talk to folks about climate change. Um, so now um, for the kind of last question or two, wanted to talk a little bit more about um, bringing equity into the climate movement. Um, and this specific question, you know, I hear um, this question generally come from a lot of people, both who are in the climate movement um, from a long time ago, from, you know, just getting started. And that question is, how do we make space for communities most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change uh, in policymaking tables or in general um, tables of power. And um, before I pass it on to y'all to answer this question, I think it's important to dissect this question a little bit and just thinking about like looking at the history of the environmental movement. Um, the environmental movement has from its inception been organized by people who have been in the front lines of, of environmental injustice. And a lot of it's due to environmental racism, especially in the US. Um, and we can think of clear examples like groups fighting uh, petrochemical plants in Cancer Alley, uh, water defenders and indigenous sovereignty groups fighting the expansion of oil pipelines, uh, many community groups fighting for the right to clean water, clean air, and conservation of the planet all over the world. Um, so this, um, this question maybe is in part about making space, but also how does the larger, um, I would say white-led environmental movement seed power um, and focus on supporting the environmental justice movement so their priorities are at the center of the table and not as an add-on um, that frankly most of the time gets left behind in negotiations. Um, so who would like to start on that question? 
I'm happy to speak to it a little bit. Um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act wasn't called the Inflation Reduction Act for until the very last minute. It was called Build Back Better or the American Jobs Plan or maybe even the Green New Deal before that, right? And so the final decisions were not made by the movement. They were made by Senator Schumer and Senator Manchin in secret in a basement. And there were some bad things added at the end of the day. That being said, in that long process from sort of the Green New Deal idea until the Inflation Reduction Act, there was a lot more work done within the environmental movement to make sure that uh, traditional environmental organizations were working with environmental justice groups. And I want to give a shout out to the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, which worked really actively to build those bridges and to make sure that there were priorities set in this bill. Um, and so, you know, it's not everything we ever wanted, and there's even some bad things in the bill, but there is, for example, $3 billion, $3 billion with a B dollars for equitable, um, for environmental justice community block grants, which is going to be money that can flow to communities to help them set their own priorities to help create resources to engage in other policy making fights. That's awesome. There's $3 billion to clean up pollution from ports. You know, the um, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is $27 billion for kind of loans and grants for a variety of things, a lot of that can be flowing into communities to do things like clean up pollution from schools. You know, we won a bunch of money, not as much as I would have liked, for cleaning up um, school buses, and that was in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law before, but we didn't win as much money to clean up like pollution in schools from those appliances that I've been talking about, the furnaces, the stoves, et cetera. And so how can we now use the money that's in the Inflation Reduction Act and make sure that it's flowing to disadvantaged communities, to flowing to folks on the front lines, which includes like young kids of color living in heavily polluted communities, right? How do we make sure that we're actually directing those funds in that way? Um, and there are other programs which already are targeted in that way, and we've got to make sure that they're implemented well. So for example, there's four and a half billion dollars for electrification rebates for low and moderate income folks to help electrify their homes. So we got a lot of work to do, but we do have some good building blocks from this policy and a lot of money, quite frankly, to start to implement what we want to do. And the reason why we have that is because uh, you know, environmental justice groups showed up, they had lots of great ideas, and they did have more of a seat at the table. It was not perfect, but, you know, ultimately the table was finished up by two guys in a basement. Um, so it's it's still a big testament to the environmental justice community that so many important policies got across the finish line. Definitely, yeah. And like Stephanie mentioned earlier, implementation does matter and how it's done and how that money is distributed and reaching communities most vulnerable, most impacted, most heavily disinvested in, um, that matters a lot. Um, how about Dr. Frumkin, we'll move with you. Yeah, well, boy, I, one of the hardest things in the world is following Leah, but I do want to say, I agree with everything she said. I would add a couple of other things. One is that we need to bring diverse young people into the movement and into leadership positions. So um, I think unlike Leah and Vin, I'm working full-time for an NGO now, and one of our big commitments is completely changing the composition of the staff in our organization over time. Uh, so that the leadership needs to look different. Another thing is that all of us who are, are old and gray need to be thinking hard about changing our attitudes. And that transfer of power uh, means that some people have to step aside and make room for other people. And that stepping aside requires a certain humility and commitment to generational change. So there's an attitudinal change that we need to go through as well. And then the last is we need to actively support policies that do some of that uh, putting resources where they're most needed. So impacted neighborhoods that are most at risk from climate change deserve to get more resources from the funding that's flowing in. Those are policies we all need to be vocally supporting. Definitely. And tying that back to what brings you, you know, joy about the youth coming into this movement. Uh, if we're going to be serious about youth leading, we have to make power for youth taking leadership positions. Right? Um, so Dr. Gupta, how about you? I, you know, I'll, I'll just, uh, just add on uh, so much has already been said that I completely agree with. I will say that if now we're in a different phase, just to build on some of our earlier themes, when it comes to knowing what climate change is doing to public health, to individual health. And so by definition, some of the messages <clears throat> exist now, some of the, the research 
that is informing this debate shows that the majority of, say, increasing temperatures and deaths from increasing temperatures are going to be in the Sahel and the Middle East or uh, places where we're going to see uh, forced migration because of climate change are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, other parts maybe uh, uh, mm -hmm. of the global south. And so by definition, as we characterize where climate change is going to wreak its greatest havoc, both in health and non-health impacts, we're going to have to be looking at solutions that have oh, uh, solutions that exist that will be funded will, by definition, at least from a global standpoint, tackle issues of equity because that's where the problem is disproportionately focused. And so that I think that's key. Number one, number two, I think you're already seeing this. I'm sure Leah can speak to this better than I can from a policy standpoint. But we're seeing big government step up with COP, for example, this year to help. Uh, from a global perspective, countries deal with the health and non-health impacts of climate change through greater climate adaptation funding. Part of this is because we're able to tell we're able to tell a better story through data, and we can we we can persuade people. I'll lastly, just quickly say some of the themes we were talking about earlier still matter when it comes to equity when we think about it at the local level. It, the things that move people are convincing stories, narratives that makes sense, that then we can build uh, a broader messaging campaign around. And so it's one thing to say, and I, and I love Leah's focus on gas stoves and what that means for say pulmonary conditions like asthma, but we need to highlight a family or a series of families for whom this was a, a tangible thing. Talk to them if they're willing to talk, get their permission, tell their story more broadly, make it as real as possible. I would even suggest that we get as gruesome as individuals who might have died from vascular compl complications from air pollution. Let's, just like we've done with smoking, time and again, these are the end impacts of smoking to our vital organs. Well, these are the end impacts of air pollution to our vital organs. We need to get some of the messaging tactics that have worked so well in public health for so long. We need to co-op some of those strategies moving forward for the climate health movement. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that that's right. Um, in many movements, we've seen that until people, you know, go out and actually talk about those impacts um, on health um, and, you know, people who have, you know, many times died from these different um, issues that we're talking about, things don't really change. Um, so that's a really, really good tactic as well. And unfortunately, um, we are at past the hour at this point. Um, but I do want to um, leave the audience with kind of one or two sentences of kind of a solution oriented question. Um, and this was something from the audience that was that people were asking. And it was generally like, how um, can I bring my, you know, unique skills set that I have or my lived experience um, to support climate change solutions? Um, <clears throat> what does that look like? And so um, if we can hear um, quickly from each of you to leave our audience with um, even more feelings of hope uh, for this movement. Well, I'll be quick. Um, I run a podcast called A Matter of Degrees. It's a climate podcast. And, you know, Lots of people listen to it. It's lots of fun. And we just did a mini series called What Can I Do? And it's about what you can do on the personal level, the professional level with your superpowers, and the political level. And so I would really encourage people to check that out if you want to sort of do a deeper dive or you, you know somebody else here want to join the movement. Um, it's degreespod.com or just a matter of degrees wherever you get podcasts. And I'll also say, what's another thing you can do? Well, you just got asked something. Could you donate to this amazing organization? And I got to say, hearing everybody share the stories about what this great organization is doing. I donated while we were talking about that. So I hope that you'll join me. And I know um, Howard also said he was going to donate too. So, you know, I think that that's a great opportunity for you to, um, you know, provide resources to an organization that's working on this stuff every day, day in and day out and making really big impacts. Thanks, Dr. Stokes. And how about Dr. Gupta? Well, it makes us it makes three of us. Uh, I'll be donating as well. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, but no, to to build on Leah's point, uh, and, and Leah, we, we all greatly appreciate your leadership across the spectrum, and and just a plus one the fact that anyone can be a climate advocate. You have a voice, uh, regardless 
uh, uh, of what your full-time job is, climate change impacts all of us. I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, and, and in addition to, 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 to voting uh, in a way that I think is climate informed, all of us have more power than we realize in this debate. I mean, just got to give a shout out to Dr. Gupta. I mean, he's a doctor. Here he is talking about pulmonary COPD. Like he's a real doctor, a medical doctor. And here he is spending his time on climate. He is a walking embodiment of, you know, anybody can be a climate leader. And so big, big props to you for everything you're doing. I want to take that one step farther for my last comment and build on the health theme, not to be too parochial, but do you know who the most trusted professions are in our society in annual survey after annual survey? Number one is nurses. Number two is doctors. You guys. That, that gives us a fantastic <laughs> responsibility and opportunity to be speaking out on this. So for all the health professionals who are on this call now, and I imagine there are more than a few given the title of the series, Use that opportunity to speak out. Be opinion leaders. You don't have to be the world's greatest expert, but uh, educate yourself enough to be able to be comfortable speaking out and then speak out. And I want to circle back finally to one of the things Leah talked about early, which is the, the, the fun of the camaraderie that comes with being part of this work. We know from uh, medical illnesses that support groups are hugely important at patients uh, surviving illnesses families doing okay through tough times. The same is true. We are a species that loves camaraderie. Mutual support feels good. It nourishes and sustains us, and it helps us do what we have to do, which is propel hope in ourselves and in others so we can see this thing through. Definitely. And that's why I love climate change webinars, especially from Climate Solutions that feel like a big support group, um, always gives me hope and motivation to keep on going. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you three so much for your time. I really appreciate you all and the work that you all are doing, and especially just to continue this conversation around hope, um, you know, never letting us lose that hope. So thank you so much. And with that, Stephanie, I'm going to pass the stage on to you to close us out. Ooh, good job, V. Excellent facilitation. We made it. It's only eight minutes past. That was a really tough panel to facilitate, I must say. There were some really amazing things being said. So uh, also big kudos to you as well. Um, and thanks. We made it. We're at the end. Good job, everyone. Uh, again, it's four. To, it's four o'clock. We started at four o'clock on a Thursday. It's a big call and a big lift to attend a Zoom webinar, an online event on a Thursday, on the end of the week, end of the day. So great job for sticking it through. That was an awesome panel. I learned so much in just um, a few short minutes as well. So um, big thanks to for attending. I want to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Leah Stokes, Dr. Van Gupta, Dr. Howard Frumkin. I want to thank Greg and Savitha and V for helping me out today, as well as our whole backstage production crew at Climb Solutions. A big lift to get this off the ground from all the staff. Um, so big thank you for folks who sent invitations, our table hosts and captains who encouraged uh, donations as well as registrations and attendance at our events. Um, I just want to remind you that tomorrow at noon, lunchtime, not four to five, much easier to make, uh, noon on Friday, we are hosting Rebecca Solnit and my a friend and colleague Kimberly Larson will be moderating that conversation. I'll be back too. It wouldn't be an event without your favorite online the Climate Solutions MC. And just quick thanks to our sponsors again. Thanks to elected officials for attending and your leadership. Thanks to all of the folks who helped uh, fundraise this month and who are continuing to do so. And thank you to all of you for attending and for sending every email, for all your text messages, for opening our emails, reading our blogs, uh, sharing the good word about climate solutions, getting folks to act on climate. It makes a huge difference in our work and it makes a big difference to us as well. All right, you can still donate. There's a link on your screen right now. And I think with that, that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.